In the Mediterranean, Middle Eastern world of the Bible, death was much closer to people and therefore life was much more real. People didn't get buried in the time of Jesus with formaldehyde pumped into their body. So that 30 years later we exhumed the body and oh my God, we got it uncorrupt. <laughs> Incorruptible. Who knew that the CEO making uh, 400 times what his base level employee was, was a saint. No. There was not that. When you buried somebody, they stank. The humando, where the word human comes from. The humando. The rot. They weren't like seeing death like Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger. Who talks about death like it's something, you know, abstract. Death. Death. No, no, no. They talked about the funk of a corpse. And they knew what it was like. Without having to vocabularize. Like many people in the world, 80% of people in the world today know. This is the kind of death that Jesus and his contemporaries knew. And it was common. And it was everywhere. So that made their life more authentic than ours, who have countless escapes from death, and therefore countless escapes from life. Artificial, protected, prophylactically sealed from the world, as it really is, in a dream world. Also, Middle Eastern cultures, and indeed a large part of the ancient and modern world, believe in spirits other than human persons densely packing and populating the air blowing around us. Good spirits, bad spirits, and just plain mischievous spirits that like to screw with us a little bit. And the reason they understood this in their experiences, one, they were open to alternate states of consciousness experiences, but also, two, because they had so little control over their lives. Like in reality, they knew they were an aneurysm away from death. And therefore, because they had so little control over their lives, they saw that everything around them could so easily take them out, was more powerful than they were. Now the West, our culture, has allowed science, and particularly the medical sciences, to explain instances of human beings possessed by spirits in a different way. This makes various gospel healing stories, like the one that we read last week in John chapter 5 about the lame man at the pool, difficult for Westerners to accept and to appreciate. From a Middle Eastern perspective, however, the meaning of these stories is very plain. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 28. Then they came to Capernaum. And on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. The people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In their synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, Quiet, come out of him. The unclean spirit convulsed him, and with a loud cry, came out of him. I'm having too much fun with these images, I think. <laughs> All were amazed and asked one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. His fame, his honor rating, spread everywhere throughout the whole region of Galilee. What was it that troubled Jesus' audiences? What was it that troubled Jesus' audience in the synoptics? And in John, is it the demon in this particular story that troubled them? 
Was it the possessed man that troubled them? Answer, no way. It is not the unclean spirit and the possessed man that troubled Jesus' audience here in Mark, because those were common and found everywhere in their world. Why they are disturbed and astonished and amazed is because Jesus is acting totally outside, out of bounds, with his inherited honor status. This artisan from Nazareth dares to teach as one having authority in the Capernaum synagogue. He is a peasant day laborer. What the hell is he doing? Who gave him authority to teach? That's why they're amazed. That's why they're actually being put off. As the listeners puzzle over the Mark and Jesus behavior, puzzle over his teaching, puzzle over his manner of teaching, a man possessed by an unclean spirit interrupts the setting by shrieking. Our ancestors in the faith believe that spirits were more powerful than human beings, but less powerful than God. Spirits readily interfered or intervened in human life, sometimes benevolently, sometimes capriciously, and sometimes malevolently. They had power to control human behavior. The spirit who possessed the man in the synagogue is central to this story because he knows Jesus' identity far better than Jesus' compatriots do. He knows that Jesus is <clears throat> the Holy One of God. What does that mean? That means a holy man, a broker with alternate reality. But much to the amazement of the people, Jesus is not controlled or cowed by this unclean spirit. Instead, Jesus shows that his authority power is stronger than that of the spirit. Jesus commands the spirit to come out of the man, and it does. Wow. The people now have an answer to why this village artisan peasant hick teaches with authority and not as the scribes do. Clearly, Jesus possesses power stronger than those of ordinary human beings. How did he get that? Where did that come from? Some Greek manuscripts have variant readings of the people's response to Jesus. Mark chapter 127. What is this? A new teaching? With authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him and they obey him. Authority is a major problem for Jesus' contemporaries, and the different gospel communities interpret this problem in their own ways, unique ways, decades after these events. No one denies that Jesus performs mighty deeds of power. None of them. Not his friends, and not his enemies. And that should give us pause. Nobody in the first century, okay, denied Jesus doing mighty deeds. That's not the problem. These are not American skeptics. What troubles them is the source of his mighty deeds, the source of his authority power. From where does it come? God? Is, is God the God of Israel, the source? What would that mean? Why would God make some peasant, the great God and patron who sits atop Sky Vault, why would he make a peasant day laborer his broker? Is it God? Mark, of course, has already told this to his listeners and readers a number of times. He opens his gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? That means God's holy one, God's broker. And John does the same resoundingly in his gospel. But to those witnessing this Galilean day laborer act like a folk healer and a prophet and an exorcist, it wasn't certain. Maybe it was God, or maybe, maybe the source of Jesus' authority comes from the world of the other lesser gods 
and spirits, the demons, archons, and beings that control the things around us and our own lives. By this early point in the narrative of Mark, the people in the synagogue at Capernaum have not yet decided. The fact, however, is very clear. Jesus, the peasant artisan from Nazareth, has authority power and effective power to do what he does. He behaves not shamefully, not out of alignment with his honor status, but rather quite honorably as God's chosen broker, as God's own son. And this is why Mark concludes the story by noting at once his reputation, his honor, began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This final note affects the honor of both Jesus and the healed man. The Gossip Network proclaims a new honor status for Jesus. He teaches with authority. He has power over unclean spirits. That contrasts with his very low honor rating, his status of Nazareth. It also restores honor to the man now released from the power of unclean spirits. He can reclaim his rightful place in the community. He is healed. The Western tendency to rationalize the ancient understanding of other than human persons called spirits is rooted in the fact that we Westerners have much more power over our lives and our circumstances than the ancients believed that they had in their part. This reading in the Gospel called Mark, together with the Johannine story of the lame man at the pool, invite us Western readers to consider how wisely or how imprudently we use our power. We have so much power here we can wipe the world out in nuclear holocaust again and again and again. We have so much resources, we could literally solve the worst cases of poverty on earth. Solve it. If we could do that and we don't do it, aren't we responsible for those who die? governments that are in control of their own country that refuse to let I'm not saying we don't have all sure refuse to let the aid it's a great point so let's let let me let me clarify what I mean by we and what I mean by wipe out I don't mean throw money at things but nobody's saying throw money at things we're talking about and I'm not even saying government mandated I'm talking about the free consciences of people who are very few that control the vast overwhelming amount of wealth and that and I'm not saying it would happen tomorrow but over time this is the enterprise but it's not gonna happen 50 years from now 100 years from now if we don't start it could be done we could solve the most crippling problems on earth that's all I'm saying I'm not saying all oh, poverty I'm not saying and that would mean it would and it would be monstrously hard but it's possible it can be done. It will not be done by throwing our arms up and saying it can't be done. Because this per these the, you know the government in say this particular island which has a regime is oppressive and will steal which happens. Which happens. But we that's part of the job. We have to work against that situation. And that can be done. Hey, thanks for watching. Just continue the playlist for the next part of the study. If you have further questions, this is good. They will get addressed, so keep watching. If you found value, please subscribe, like, and share. As always, questions, comments, and criticisms are most welcome. God bless you.